Welcome to Deschutes Public Library's online programming. You are here today for a presentation called No Burn, Bringing Burning Man to the High Desert Museum about the exhibit that is on display down at the High Desert Museum. Um, this program is part of our No Burn series during the month of May, where we looked at a lot of things having to do with fire, including how to live in a fire adapted community, which we do here in Central Oregon. Also a historical program about the fire lookouts and fire history in Bend. Today's presenters are Laura Ferguson, PhD. She is the Senior Curator of Western History at the High Desert Museum, and Dustin Cockerham, who is the Art and Experience Developer at the High Desert Museum. Please welcome Dustin and Laura. Hi, Liz. Thanks for including us in the No Burn series. And thank you to all of you for joining us. I'm glad to have this opportunity to share with you more about our exhibition, Infinite, Infinite Moment, Burning Man on the Horizon, and about what went into creating this exhibition. I'm joined by my co-curator of this exhibition, Dustin Cockerham. I'll provide some background information about Burning Man, share some of our experiences at the annual event, and then Dustin will share more about the art in the exhibition and the inspiration behind it. The High Desert Museum is located in Bend, Oregon. The museum sits on 135 acres, much of which is Ponderosa Forest. It's a beautiful setting for exploring the history, culture, and ecology of the High Desert. This place-based focus enables us to take a multidisciplinary approach. One of my favorite things about the museum is the variety of topics we explore and the experiences that are available to visitors. From watching the otters play, seeing birds of prey up close, or learning more about the history and culture of the indigenous plateau. Our mission at the museum is to connect people to the high desert, a geographical area between the Cascade and Rocky Mountains. We're always looking for new stories to tell, new communities to highlight, and new ways to bring a deeper understanding and appreciation of this unique place. And it's this desire that brought us to Burning Man. Why Burning Man, you might ask? Why did we want to tell this story? Before I answer that, I want to share with you some background information about Burning Man. In many ways, it began as a lark. In 1986, two friends, Larry Harvey and Jer um, Jerry James, invited a few others to mark the summer solstice by burning an eight-foot wooden man on Baker Beach in San Francisco. Over the next few years, word spread and the celebration grew. As it grew, so did the scrutiny. One year, the police forbade Harvey from burning the man on the beach. A few folks who were part of a counterculture group in San Francisco invited Harvey to join them in Black Rock Desert over Labor Day weekend. Over the years, Burning Man grew from a casual gathering to the nonprofit organization it is today. The number of attendees at the annual Burning Man event has grown exponentially as well, from 35 people to 80,000. It's a gathering that's guided by 10 principles. These 10 principles are radical inclusion, gifting, decommodification, radical self-reliance, radical self-expression, communal effort, civic responsibility, leaving no trace, participation, and immediacy. They grew out of and sustained the Burning Man community. They're not commandments though. They weren't crafted to dictate how people should act, but rather they're a reflection of the community's ethos and culture as it organically developed. In bringing Burning Man to the high desert, we sought to tell a story we hadn't told before. We wanted to highlight the culture and community that makes up Burning Man and Black Rock City. We were also intrigued by and excited about the art at Burning Man. We wanted to illuminate what makes the art at Burning Man different from what one generally encounters at a museum or in a gallery. Instead of viewing works from a safe distance, the art at Burning Man invites interaction and engagement. Artist collectives and the Burning Man community come together to create the art at Burning Man. We wanted to learn more about the way that the art and the community sustain and energize one another. At the High Desert Museum, we're especially known for immersive scenes and interactive exhibitions, and the participatory nature of Burning Man seemed like a great fit. As we prepared to do an exhibition on Burning Man, we partnered with the Burning Man Project, the nonprofit that oversees the event. 
We learned a lot from the Burning Man project and had an the opportunity to borrow some objects that are now on display as a part of the exhibition. We also worked with local burners who were tremendously generous in sharing their knowledge and experience. But ultimately, in order to create the exhibition, we needed to experience it for ourselves. A team of three of us, Dustin, myself, and Gus Braden from the museum loaded up in a box truck and headed down to Black Rock Desert to take part in Burning Man for the first time. The drive took about six hours to get to Gerlach, a town of about 100 people that's at the edge of Black Rock Desert. After a final stop in Gerlach, we headed to the playa. As we drove onto Black Rock Desert, a roadway and signs greeted us. We spent a few hours crawling along as we made our way to the gate. While we waited, our first dust storm came up. The air got thick. Full of nervous anticipation, we looked out on the whiteout conditions that surrounded the box truck. And I think we all wondered a little bit what we had gotten ourselves into. But by the time we got through the gates and a greeting that included rolling in the playa dust and setting our intention for our burn, we found a camp near the edge of the city. The sky cleared just in time for a gorgeous sunset. For me, one of the most amazing experiences of the entire burn was riding out onto the playa that first night. It was unlike anything I had ever seen. The playa was filled with art cars, glowing whimsical forms floating across the playa. Bikes all lit up flowed past us. Everywhere I looked, there was something new to see. The city was humming with energy, joy, and excitement. It perhaps felt just a little bit like Las Vegas, but without any of the commercialism, which gave everything an entirely different feel. Clearly so much work had gone into everything that was around us, all for the purpose of play, self-expression, community, and joy. And Dustin too mentioned that this was one of the most memorable parts of the experience. Dustin, what stands out to you about that first night riding out onto the playa? For me, that's when it all came alive. Uh, the anticipation and all the thoughts and ideas I had beforehand kind of melted away in that moment. And it became a reality that you can't quite wrap your head around and just have to be fully immersed in to experience. Over the next few days we settled in, we sought to explore and experience as much as we could. We'd head out on our bikes during the day, riding through the city, checking out theme camps and exploring the art. Here, you're looking at the camps that encircle the city. And this was um, very similar to where we were camped. Black Rock City is laid out like a clock with the man in the middle, surrounded by theme camps, and then open camping where we were. And on the outside, um, beyond the city is the deep playa where you'll find much of the art. Each year, Black Rock City rises out of the desert. It starts with the placement of the golden spike, which marks where the sculpture of the man will stand and serves as a reference point for everything else in the city. Surveyors spend a week laying out the radial and arterial roads that make up the city's iconic layout. Volunteers stake out the city's perimeter and erect nine miles of fencing to contain people and catch any stray windblown moop, which is matter out of place. In a few short weeks, the rest of the city's infrastructure takes shape as volunteers work to set up the electrical grid, roads and street signs, a central cafe, and even an airport. Theme camps make up the city. Each theme camp offers something unique to the Burning Man community. It might be a bar, a place to rest and connect, a lemonade stand, or a taco camp. Anything you can imagine exists somewhere in Black Rock City. Part of the magic is simply being open to whatever you might find. The art at Burning Man is incredible. Born out of collaboration and fostering connectivity, art is at the center of Burning Man. Black Rock City provides a rare opportunity for artists. Freed from the inhibitions and commercial constraints of the art world, artists can be more experimental, risk-taking, and expressive. And unlike in a traditional gallery setting, the art in Black Rock City is participatory. It invites one to climb, touch, move, respond, and interact. 
The playa offers a unique context as well. It's an ever-shifting backdrop. At times, a seemingly blank canvas of bright white silt and pale blue sky, which can quickly give way to swirling dust storms. Each evening, everything changes as the sky darkens and the art lights up, transforming once again. We laughed, played, and talked with people. And even in a city of nearly 80,000, sometimes we had a little piece of the playa all to ourselves. Many days we napped during the hottest part of the day and then headed back out at night. The evenings brought unbridled joy. The art installations and art cars were all lit up and the simplest things like walking through a string of lights brought so much pleasure. The art installations engaged all of our senses and offered a chance to be fully in the moment. At each turn, there was something new to discover. You couldn't possibly see it all. And even if you somehow managed to see everything, so much of what made the experience significant was what was happening at that exact moment. In a world in which we all seem to have a fear of missing out, there was so much going on all over the playa and each moment seemed to have a magic of its own that for me at least, that feeling of FOMO completely disappeared. Each night, one of the large installations went up in flames. It was an incredible sight to see so much effort and materials on fire. It was spectacular. It highlighted the immediacy of the moment. This piece um, it was called The Folly, and it was one of our favorites. It was a beautiful structure made of reclaimed wood and filled with intricate mosaics. One night we spent over an hour at the Folly dancing and listening to the music. The next night we watched it burn. Another favorite moment was watching the sunrise at the edge of Black Rock City. Alongside the first night and riding out onto the playa for the first time, this was one of the most memorable parts of the experience for Dustin and me. Dustin, why did this moment leave such an impression? For me, a sunrise on Black Rock City gave a bit of a sense of normalcy and an otherwise open-ended experience. It anchored you in a moment, but yet it was just as ephemeral as everything else around you. In the days and weeks after Burning Man, the three of us from the High Desert Museum all reflected on the experience. We were struck by the participatory nature of Burning Man, the tactile, physical, engaging nature of the art, the openness, the warmth and generosity of the community, the play and whimsy and the all encompassing nature of the experience. At various points, we all felt a sense of awe and um, had feelings of pure joy. And Dustin really beautifully captured the experience with the phrase reverent irreverence. And this really seemed to capture our experience at Burning Man. Dustin, will you say a little bit more about what you were getting at with this phrase, reverent irreverence? It's something I think is very unique to Burning Man. You wouldn't see a juxtaposition like that in a traditional gallery setting. The temple, for example, is somewhere that's very special and quiet and people hold with a lot of reverence. And then there can be something very whimsical and absurd right next to it, whether it's a giant glowing sheep or a flaming octopus. And people seem to cherish both of those equally, the absurd right alongside the deeply personal. So this left us asking ourselves, how do we capture and share this seemingly elusive experience? We did this in part through text and photos. Outside of the main exhibition space, we created a gallery wall with objects borrowed from the Burning Man project and text that offered additional context and background about Burning Man. In terms of the design, we based the layout on a 19th century gallery wall that you might find at a museum during that time. And we were drawing on the Burning Man principle to leave no trace. Um, we reused and repurposed a lot of old frames. Our goal was to give the wall kind of a whimsical and eclectic look and really to even um, kind of make a laughing reference to museums of old. We highlighted the 10 principles that are at the very heart of Burning Man. 
I'll give you a moment to read them over. If you're curious to learn more, I'd encourage you to check out the Burning Man Journal online. It's a fascinating site with several posts by people reflecting on the event, the experience, the culture, and its principles. The journal will give you a deeper understanding of why Burning Man matters to burners and how these principles shape the event, and for many, the ways that they also shape their lives outside of Burning Man. We sought to create moments of joy and discovery through, for example, our own take on the Talk to God phone. This was one of our favorite things that we stumbled across while biking through Black Rock City. It was a simple payphone, but on the other end was a thoughtful and even at times profound speaker. You could pick up the phone and ask any question and get an answer that might be joking or might be really thoughtful and incredibly helpful. At Black Rock City, you could have this a conversation. Um, and as a nod to this experience, although slightly less interactive, but still offers a message for those who listen, um, we brought a payphone and a message from God to, to visitors. Thus far, each of the components I've highlighted are outside of the main gallery. And they seek to bring visitors into the experience and offer some context. The gallery itself is absent of text panels and historical objects. Instead, we wanted to recreate for visitors that sense of stepping onto the playa. One of the focal pieces in the gallery is this piece titled Ghost Truck One. Dustin, you were key to envisioning and creating this work. What was the inspiration behind the truck? Stepping onto the playa can be incredibly disorienting and not only are art cars and mutant vehicles a very integral part of Burning Man, but we wanted to create an access point. And we wanted to take the familiar and turn it into the unexpected to draw people in. Can you tell us about a bit more about the process of making this piece? How did you do it? First, we found an old Willie's truck outside of Terrebonne and took it back to the museum and started working on it. We really liked the idea of a Willie's truck because most people had a story about an old Willie's, whether it was you know, on their grandpa's farm or it was the hardware out in front of their hardware store in the town they grew up in or something. And this was a really good piece to start to draw people in on playing with the familiar and the unfamiliar. I know you worked with the artist Jesse Small to create this piece. Why did you want to work with Jesse specifically? Jesse's work has always had a history of kind of deconstructing the familiar and presenting it in a new way. And he's also always been very playful. In fact, the title of the piece, Ghost Truck One, was actually titled by his five-year-old son because that was the title he liked the most. And I think something really beautiful about this piece, and Jesse said it, is that you see it all at once. It's not necessarily that you're seeing something you haven't seen before, but you're seeing it all at once, which is something you don't normally see. And I think that is very indicative of Burning Man. You see so many things all at once that you're overwhelmed and can't process how they relate. Um, there's a very hauntingly organic kind of part to this. And then it shifts as we built the backside to it. And all of this was cut by hand with a plasma torch, um, all intuitively. So you mentioned the back of the truck. Um, and I know you kind of sent the front of the truck down to Jesse in LA. Um, he did his process and then sent it back up to us in Bend. Um, once you got the truck back to Bend, you know, how did you come up with the dodecahedron for the back? And will you tell us a bit about creating that piece? Once we had the front part of the truck and we started to begin to manipulate the familiar, we really wanted to bring people into the unknown. 
and we wanted them to come in closer because a lot like Burning Man, the closer you look at it, the bigger the experience gets. And so with the dodecahedron, it's a mirrored um, programmed LED experience where you look inside and it's changing and moving and you can never see the end of it. And the, the overall piece, I think is hard to understand where it fits in a time and place. It could be from the past or a distant future. And Burning Man has a, a very interesting way of making you think about where you are in a time and place and having that melt away as well. Yeah, that's really interesting. So will you say just a little more about kind of how you saw it all coming together in this final piece? We really wanted it to be playful and draw people in so that you could move around it and have a different experience. Um, the front of the vehicle has kind of googly eyes and whether that's to make it sentient or just to be silly, uh, I think leaves a lot for people to explore. And then the lights as they move around and they're mirrored, you can't see your own reflection as you look into a mirror and that's something very captivating and the lights themselves can kind of put you in a trance. So we really wanted that, that kind of experience of being able to get in close to something. Ghost Truck One is just one of several interactive art installations in the gallery. How do the other large scale interactive pieces fit with your goals for the exhibition overall? doesn't even become art or come alive until until the visitor becomes part of it. So we really wanted to bring experiential artwork into the gallery that you had to interact with to understand it. And the more people that interact with this, the more it becomes alive. And it changes each time depending on who you're with and how you're interacting with it. Um, and coincidentally, uh, all of these things can actually still be done with proper social distancing. So we really encourage people to come experience them. Well, Dustin, that so nicely too connects to the title of the exhibition, Infinite Moment, which you came up with. Um, and I know you've mentioned this juxtaposition um, a few different times. So I wondered if you might just say a little bit about what you were getting at there with Infinite Moment and how that's connecting to these works as well. Yeah, the most literal connection is probably the infinity room dodecahedron on the back of the truck where you can't see the end and it goes on, you know, infinitely, but it also only exists in a moment that you experience and then disappears, but yet is left, has left a really um, incredible impression on you, much like Burning Man and stepping onto the playa. The space feels infinite and the experience does as well, but it is very short. It's a very short window of time. It's just a few days in the desert that never repeats itself. That really resonated with all of us when we got back and felt like just a really nice, um, a fitting title for the show. In addition to the exhibition, we wanted to explore Burning Man through our programs. And one such event, Nightlight, took place in early March. We had DJs creating sounds of the playa, theme camp inspired food, um, people could explore the gallery, and it all culminated in an outdoor party centering on this structure. Dustin, how do you see the elements of Burning Man coming together in Nightlight and in this structure that you, along with a few others at the museum, created? The Burning Man isn't Burning Man without fire, and whether fire is representational of a cleansing or of a finale, it's something so important to Burning Man. And we got a bunch of old pallets donated and, and built this structure with the help of local burners. And the playfulness of it is we were handing out marshmallows from inside of it. And then an hour later, everyone gathered around as it went up in flames. And then as those flames fell to ash, you could roast your marshmallows on that. 
And so it's this kind of complete experience that that highlights the impermanence of all of it and maybe a bit of the absurdness, but it's completely contained in this one experience and, and it doesn't repeat again. It's, it's all in the moment. For us, this experience of, you know, being at Burning Man, working with local burners, working with Burning Man project, um, really reflecting on our experience and thinking about how we could translate it into the gallery culminated in our exhibition, Infinite Moment, Burning Man on the Horizon. And for us, Burning Man was a place to dream, a place to create and connect, a place to experience a community apart from our everyday lives. And we hoped that the exhibition would give visitors this same sense of community and culture and ultimately a deeper appreciation for this place and the things that make up the high desert. We'd love for you to come see and experience the exhibition and we've extended the run of this show through January 3rd, 2021. And please check our website for more information about the museum um, and its reopening and current programs. Liz, we'd love to answer any questions you might have. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have a couple. Um, beautiful exhibit, and I know Burning Man, the experience uh, really leaves a lasting impression on, on everybody who attends. Um, and when we first, when at the library, we first heard that you were going to be doing an exhibit about Burning Man, we were all like, what's that going to look like? Uh, and clearly, you've, you embraced the idea and have come up with a really interactive and interesting exhibit, and I look forward to seeing it. Um, but I do, I want, I want, my biggest question is what are you going to do with Ghost One, <laughs> the Ghost Truck One, when you're done with this exhibit? Well, there is a big goal of trying to bring Ghost Truck One in whatever form it may be to Black Rock City. Um, we want Playa Dust running through that vehicle and we want to drive it and share it with everyone. Um, until then, there's there's a few ideas of how to use it as outreach within our community. And we wanna hopefully take it, take it to places um, where people really wouldn't expect to see that. Yeah, beautiful work. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, that Burning Man is so central uh, to so many people, um, whether they're going to refresh themselves, remind themselves of the 10 principles. And I'm wondering now that it's been canceled this year, um, how are burners or have you heard how burners may be trying to fill that gap this year? You yeah, know, I, oh, go ahead, Dustin. No, sorry. Burning Man is going virtual this year. And so I am really excited to see how I mean, it's always been kind of an incubator for innovation among artists and community. And I'm excited to see what new methodologies emerge out of that. And I, I have no idea what that's going to look like, but I think it'll be something incredible. And then I know there's also probably some satellite events happening um, with local burners. Uh, and I think probably some in our own state. I too am really curious to see what this virtual event is going to look like. And I think it will open up some really interesting possibilities. Um, I think the thing that I was also really struck with is how much the 10 principles are things that you know, so many burners have really taken into and made a part of themselves. And um, one conversation that I had with a few people while I was there was kind of how do you take the elements of Burning Man and bring it into your life? So I do think it will be, um, and you know, people refer to kind of everyday life as the default world. So I think it will be interesting too to see the ways that um, you know burners in smaller groups, um, you know, kind of create um, some of the the key elements that that give them that sense of community, of being refreshed, of play. Um, that you were mentioning, Liz, and I think that was one of the other things that really stood out to me is how 
there are ways in which there's kind of a, a, some common themes throughout Burning Man, but also it is such an individual experience for everyone. Yeah, I, I, I really can't wait to come out and see. Um, and then this is just sort of a, I'm curious about the whole experience on the playa. Um, what were the three most important things that you brought with you out to Black Rock City that you, if you hadn't had, it would have just been a disaster? One that immediately comes to mind is a bike. Um, I was, we had so much fun, as we mentioned, biking around and it's such a big space. You definitely want to have a bike. Um, and I think um, going forward, I think we'd all think a little bit more about having a slightly more comfortable bike seat. I think we all were in some, uh, some decent pain. Um, I'll have to give a little thought to the other two. I, I think one that's actually pretty funny right now is a bandana for the wow. dust storms. Um, that and a hat because the environment, you know, the Black Rock Desert, you know, cares not whether you are there or not. <laughs> um, so it's really interesting to see how, how, how many ways people have kind of adapted to that space and that environment. But a hat and a handkerchief were very, very important. You know, when you talk about the handkerchief and the mask, um, I, it was brought to my attention that uh, there is a community within the Burning Man community called Burners Without Borders who have been responding to a variety of disasters, natural disasters, helping people. Um, just because they are such a prepared community, they have a lot of stuff and a lot of skills um, and have brought those to bear in places where people need help, including gathering of, of masks to share with um, medical professionals right now. I, and I think that is such a, an obvious extension of the 10 principles um, and such a wonderful way that the Burning Man community can help others or has demonstrated the willingness to help others. I think that I, I completely agree. Um, and that was definitely something that we really experienced on Playa was just a real generosity of spirit. So I think one of the other things I would say bring is bring some extras of something and it doesn't even matter what. I think one of our, uh, of, really fun afternoon um, was one afternoon that we spent with our neighbors and everyone just brought out some extra food they brought and we'd all brought something different but by the time everybody grabbed their their extras we had kind of a really fun assortment of you know um, popsicles and um, some fresh vegetables that we still had that were still good which tasted amazing on the playa so just kind of the most unexpected simplest things um, bring a lot of joy in a place that you don't kind of have some of your, your usual comforts. Um, and I'd also say, you know, bring, bring something fun and goofy that you wouldn't necessarily wear in your everyday life. I'm not necessarily usually a costume person, but it was really fun to dress up and to be playful and to kind of connect with a part of yourself that you maybe don't get to um, in everyday life. Um, well, I want to thank you both so much for joining us today. This has been really interesting and I encourage um, everybody to head on out to the High Desert Museum when it, are you open? Are you opening? We are, we are not open yet. We are working on, um, you know, we are doing a lot right now to figure out the best way to welcome folks back and um, hopefully, fingers crossed, we will be reopening um, in the coming weeks. Yes, yeah, sounds familiar. Um, well, thanks again, Dustin and Laura. We sure appreciate it. And um, hopefully we'll see you soon. Thanks, Liz. Thank you. Thank you.